Uh, thank you very much, and I want to thank the Mad City Vegan Fest for having me and all the work you do. Um, it's amazing turnout today. It's such a beautiful day to be in Madison. I'm so glad I'm here. Um, and so I'm going to talk about vegan nutrition, and I try to report this information, uh, what's written in the scientific literature, and then give it to vegans and people interested in becoming vegan. Um, and I was asked to, to ask everyone a question. Can I ask how many people here are vegan or consider themselves vegan? Wow, that's awesome. Okay, great. Well, here is me fishing in 1986. Um, this was a fishing trip I went on and it made me start to think hard about how uh, humans treat animals and whether the way we treat them is right. The next year, in, I was in college and I came across the book Animal Liberation by Peter Singer. And in that book, he made the, the argument um, that speciesism is wrong. And what speciesism, it, what he wrote is, racists violate the principle of equality by giving greater weight to the interests of members of their own race when there's a clash. Sexists violate the principle of equality by favoring the interests of their own sex. And similarly, speciesists allow the interests of their own species to override the greater interests of members of other species. And that, um, the pattern is identical in each case. And that really struck a chord with me and hit home. And so then I went on to, let's see, I went, fa so fast forward 30 years, um, my hair is gone and I run an organization that promotes a vegan lifestyle. Um, as uh, Mikey said, we, m our main focus is to hand out our booklets on college campuses throughout uh, the United States, Canada, Australia, Mexico, and in August we'll be uh, moving on to New Zealand as well. And uh, we give uh, booklets to over a million students at over a thousand schools each semester now. Um, I also, uh, soon after founding Vegan Outreach in 93, I found that spreading a vegan lifestyle was very intertwined in, uh, with nutrition. People had a lot of questions. Uh, there was a lot of ideas about how we should promote a, a vegan lifestyle, how much health should be a part of that, what a vegan diet does to your health. Um, it, the questions were so, uh, so strongly ingrained that I decided to be, go back to school and become a registered dietitian. Uh, that led me to founding veganhealth.org where I would report uh, the scientific literature on vegan uh, diets as it came out. And eventually, I start, uh, wrote this, co-wrote this book with Ginny Messina, Vegan for Life. That came out in 2011. So um, I want to talk about, uh, first go over the research on vegan diets and disease. And um, a vegan diet has been practiced in the Western world since the mid-1940s. Now, there's a lot of rumors about if it, how, whether a vegan diet has been practiced in any sort of uh, fashion in the Eastern or the non-Western world and we don't have a lot of good information on that so I stick to talking about what's been found among Western vegans and not only for that reason but also because that's the way most of us eat we eat like Western vegans because that's where we live um, so the rates of disease of vegetarians started to be studied in the 1960s it was mostly lacto ovo vegetarians um, and since then, and I'm going to talk about what the research has shown that has come out since the 60s when this started to be done. There's two ways to look at uh, studying nutrition. One is through clinical trials that are, tend to be short term and uh, done with unhealthy populations. And that's not really going to be my focus here today. A lot of other vegan nutritionists talk about that. But I want to talk more about ob observational studies, which are some are cross-sectional, where they just take a slice in time and they compare vegans to non-vegans. Uh, and see what the differences are. But a better way to study is prospect, uh, prospective cohorts where you, uh, f you take a group of people that are generally healthy at the beginning and you follow them over time and you see what differences happen between them uh, and then compare the different diets that they're on. So far there's been so far there has been six large vegetarian cohorts um, and you can see them here the Adventist mortality study started in 1960, ended in 65. There were very few vegans in that one. And the UK health food shopper study and the Adventist health study. The Oxford vegetarian study had more vegans, and I'm going to talk about what these studies found briefly in a bit. Uh, but now there's two ongoing studies that have a whole lot of vegans in them. The Epic Oxford study has 2,600 vegans, and Adventist health study, too, has 5,500. These are ongoing, and, and uh, 
The way these studies are done is that they release reports on an ongoing basis. And so every few months, another report comes out looking at a various disease and, and what the differences are. So um, on a cross-sectional level, they have, there's been a big difference in body mass index between vegans and um, regular meat eaters. Um, and I say regular meat eaters because usually people who eat meat, who eat no meat but fish are also included in the studies. And sometimes semi-vegetarians, which are defined as people who eat uh, meat uh, less than once a week but more than once a month. So right here, if you look at the body mass index is a measure of your, your body weight in, in relation to your height. And a healthy body mass index is considered to be between 20 and 25. Uh, 25 to 30 is considered overweight, and over 30 is considered obese. Um, vegans have the lowest body mass in index on average. It's 22.5, right smack in the middle of the, um, the healthy range, and then compared to meat eaters at 24.4 in Epic Oxford, and this study was done in the UK. Then there's also uh, info from the Adventist Health Study 2, which is done in the United States. The people in Adventist Health Study 2 are Seventh-day Adventists. They are uh, they belong to a religion that promotes a vegetarian diet among their congregation and it's a good way, they also have very low rates of smoking and, and drinking and so it's a good way to study people with healthy lifestyles uh, and just find out what the, the diet difference is versus maybe if someone eats a good diet then they have a lot of other healthy lifestyle uh, factors as well. So Seventh-day Adventists are the main group of people that have been studied in the United States in regard to vegetarianism. And once again, the vegans have a healthy body mass index about in the middle, and meat eaters are actually halfway between overweight and, ob and obese in the, among the Seventh-day Adventists. So looking at uh, also cross-sectionally cholesterol in Western vegans, I took all the studies between 1980 and 2003, and there hasn't been much released since then, so I haven't updated it. Uh, and I averaged all the vegans' cholesterol levels and I only chose the studies where it didn't matter what your cholesterol level was to get into the study, because sometimes you won't, they'll only take people with heart disease or something like that. In this case, it was just average people being measured. Um, there were about, uh, vegan's cholesterol averaged 160 compared to meat eaters at 202. So there's quite a big difference there. Um, if you look at the LDL and HDL uh, fractions of cholesterol, the LDL is the, the bad cholesterol, the HDL is the good. The, there's a big difference with vegans uh, having a low LDL at, compared to meat eaters. So average vegan LDL was 90 compared to 121. Also, lacto, if, if it's not clear, these are lacto-ovo-vegetarians uh, who, they're vegetarian and they drink milk and eat eggs uh, it, in very, there's no average amount that they eat. I mean, some of them probably eat a lot and some of them probably eat very little, so it's, it's hard to know. But anyway, on average, they were at 106. Triglycerides is um, another fat in your blood that you want to keep low. And once again, the vegans had an average of 87 at, compared to meat eaters at 108. So vegans are doing pretty good cross-sectionally in terms of our body weight and our blood lipids. Now if we look at blood pressure, um, this first study was, uh, okay, so these are, I'm still in cross-sectional data, so we're still taking a slice, a slice out of people uh, at one time. Um, in terms of people being diagnosed with high blood pressure, vegans are diagnosed at a rate of 8% for men, for women, 6% for men. If you compare it to meat eaters, 12% for women and 15% for men. So there's about twice, twice as many meat eaters as vegans were diagnosed with high blood pressure in this study. Uh, there's also been one, uh, some info from the Adventist Health Study too, and that is where they, they uh, determined a risk for each group and they set the meat eater risk at one and then the vegans risk of having high blood pressure was 0.25. So we, vegans had a 75% lower chance of, being di uh, of having high blood pressure. Um, let me say a, real briefly, these confidence intervals are to determine whether the finding is due to random chance or whether it is a um, whether it's statistically significant. And the way to determine that is if 1.0 is in the confidence interval. So 1.0 is not even close to the confidence interval here, meaning that this, this finding is, is very st statistically significant. And I'm going to have that on a few other slides. If you, so now we get into prospective uh, cohort findings. They followed uh, people in the Adventist Health Study 2 for two years. 
to see who, who was diagnosed with diabetes after two years. Um, once again, they set the meat eaters risk at 1.0, and they found that vegans had a 0.38 chance of being diagnosed with diabetes after two years compared to meat eaters. So there was a, a very significant difference. I don't have the confidence intervals up here, but it, it was uh, statistically significant as well. They uh, adjusted the study for lots of other lifestyle factors, such as physical activity is going to be an obvious one, and body mass index, which is BMI. So even once you adjust for body mass index, vegans still had a, a very low rate of type 2 of diabetes. Most of it would be type 2. Um, there's been some research recently that's come out uh, looking at cancer rates of vegans. So compared to regular meat eaters, uh, Epic Oxford found that vegans had a 19%, 19 lower risk of being diagnosed with cancer. Um, there there's, have been very uh, few findings on specific cancers that have shown a statistically significant difference between vegans and, and non-vegans because the numbers are so low. You need a whole lot of people to find differences in cancer rates. But in terms of general cancer, vegans uh, were found to have a, a somewhat lower risk. Adventist Health Study 2 found something very similar in which vegans had a 16% lower risk. Both these findings were just barely statistically significant, uh, but they, they did reach significance. Now heart disease, there's been only one cohort study followed with significant amount of vegans that has looked at heart disease. And this didn't divide the vegans out. It, the vegetarians are lacto-ovo-vegetarians and vegans combined. Together, they had a 30% lower risk of being diagnosed with heart disease compared to non-vegetarians. Um, and that would in, the non-vegetarians would include fish eaters, so that's uh, showing somewhat of a difference there, possibly. I mean, it would be better to have everyone sorted out, and I'm sure that that's going to be coming out soon. Um, but for now, that's what we know. And hopefully, vegans will once again be even lower than that, but we'll see. There's been a few, uh, geez, sorry. There's been a few um, uh, studies that have looked at mortality rates. And the Adventist Health Study, the first one, they found that vegetarian women lived two and a half years longer and vegetarian men lived three years longer than non-vegetarians. Uh, in 1999, there was a meta-analysis where they took the data from all those top studies that I showed in the beginning that, that are not currently ongoing, and they determined the mortality rates of the different diet groups. Uh, Fish eaters and lacto-ovo vegetarians had statistically significantly lower um, rates of mortality, and um, vegans had the same exact rate as regular meat eaters in that study. There were only six, only 68 vegans had died in that study, so it was a very small number to determine it, a, a rate. And as you can see, the confidence interval was very, very wide as well. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about. Um, Nutrients that are of concern or are thought to be of concern for, uh, for vegans especially, but also some for vegetarians. And I, this is veganhealth.org. I'm going to be talking about some recommendations for what I think uh, vegans should be, uh, how much vegans should get of certain nutrients, and I, so that you don't have to write them down um, if you're interested in knowing them. Uh, if you go to veganhealth.org and click in the upper left on recommendations, they're all right there in a nice chart where you can see what I'm recommending. So let's see, what's the first question about nutrients um, that we get as vegans? Oh man, where do get your protein? Okay, um, so what a lot of people don't know is that plants have protein. And I'm gonna go over a few plants and, and compared to, so first I'm gonna look at a Burger King burger. It has 380 calories and 19 grams of protein. Now let's compare some plant foods. A Whole Foods bean burrito has 320 calories and 10 grams of protein. It's not as much, but it's decent. Spaghetti has 330 calories and 12 grams of protein. It's creeping up there a bit. And a tofurkey Italian sausage has only 280 calories and 30 grams of protein. Uh, way more than a Burger King burger. Um, so, I mean, that's just some, some foods and so you can compare that plant foods do have protein. Okay, so can any vegans get too little protein? And I'm saying, of course we can. And that is if all you eat is, does anyone know? Soda and potato chips and french fries. And we all know lots and lots of vegans that eat that way, right? 
I'm, I'm kidding, I actually don't know any vegans that eat that way, but that is what I hear a lot of. Um, so vegans are not gonna get full-blown uh, protein deficiency, which is known as kwashiorkor, and it happens among people that live in, in locations, uh, not in the United States, but where there's so little protein that they, they just don't get any, and it makes them, their stomachs bloat, and it's a very horrible disease. So, the, so vegans are not gonna get this. You don't get this in the United States. Um, however, uh, there is a question about, well, what's the ideal amount of amino acids? And we all hear about complete protein, that animal protein is complete protein, but plant protein isn't. So um, the way to determine whether people are getting enough, an ideal amount of protein would be to do nitrogen balance studies on them, um, where you measure, nit nitrogen is, is a, a molecule found in protein, and, that's, and it's very important for building uh, proteins in our body and so we need to get the nitrogen from protein whereas carbohydrates and fat don't have nitrogen so you basically measure how much someone's eating and then how much uh, nitrogen they're losing and you determine whether they're in nitrogen balance now interestingly enough with all the talk about vegan diets and and uh, protein there's not a single nitrogen balance study that's ever been done on vegans so we don't have a lot a lot of what I'm talking about here is theoretical. Um, so one thing to be aware of is that um, all plant foods do have all the essential amino acids. Now some have one of the amino acids in a slightly less amount than the rest, and so they're not considered complete proteins. But, but basically for any plant food, if you eat just more of it, you're gonna get enough of all the essential amino acids. Now we generally eat a range of different plant foods, so we're getting a different combinations of foods with higher or, or lower amounts of amino acids. When you add it all up, there's one amino acid that's limiting in, oops, sorry, that's already up there, in vegan diets, and that is lysine. So I'm gonna talk, and I do think it's important that vegans, vegans generally are gonna get a lot of lysine. It's not uh, difficult to do, but there are some people that just avoid all foods high in lysine. Um, and so that's, it, it's something to be aware of. These are. High, these are foods that are high in both protein and lysine. Legumes, it's a wide range of what legumes are. Soy, tofu, tempeh, edamame, soy milk, soy meats, uh, any kind of beans, any kind of peas, including green peas, lentils, and peanuts are all legumes. Quinoa is also high in both protein and lysine. Seitan is very high in protein and lysine. Uh, pistachios, pumpkin seeds, and amaranth. You probably don't eat a lot of amaranth. But you can, you can cook it and eat it like rice. Some people like it and some people don't. Um, so here are my protein recommendations for vegans. Eat two to three servings of high lysine foods per day. Uh, I think athletes should eat more than two or three servings. They're generally hungrier, so they're gonna eat more, uh, uh, probably on accident. Um, older people need to err on the side of higher protein foods. As you get older, your body doesn't retain muscle mass as well, and you need protein to keep your, your uh, bone mass up as well. So um, that's something to, for older vegans to be aware of. And if you find that you're getting colds frequently, I would suggest eating more protein. And if you do eat more protein, here's what you're going to look like. There you go. <laughs> he got that way from eating protein. But this is a vegan who ate who ate enough protein and is uh, doing fine. And here's another one, and another one. So you can build muscle with a vegan diet. These people are getting plenty of protein. If you really are worried about protein, there are, there are definitely protein supplements that you can take. I don't think most people, even most athletes, need to do that. Okay, so um, the next nutrient, nutrient I'm most concerned about these days with vegans is calcium because I think it's been very neglected and that's been due to a, no, a, a number of ideas that have been proven not to be correct in recent years, but that are still prevalent in our community. So if you look at the average intakes of calcium among vegans, lacto ovo vegetarians and meat eaters, you see that there's a pretty big discrepancy there. and uh, the, the um, dietary reference intake for calcium, what the government recommends is 1,000 milligrams per day. And so vegans are about close, looking at about half of that on average. That's, that's a bunch of studies that, that have looked at vegan intakes. Okay, so the question is, are these low intakes a problem? And the past theories have been 
that osteoporosis is a disease of calcium loss, not an intake deficiency. So in other words, you don't get osteoporosis because you're not eating enough calcium. You get it because you're losing calcium from your bones. Also, countries with high dairy intake have high hip fractures. So that, that's another indication that you don't need calcium. In fact, calcium might be, uh, that you don't, that dairy might be cause hip fractures and you certainly don't need calcium. Um, there's been, there was research in the 90s showing animal protein leached calcium from your bones. In other words, if you give someone a bunch of animal protein and then you measure their, cal their urine, uh, you'll see there's a lot of calcium in it. And finally, we do know that leafy greens are high in absorbable calcium, magnesium, potassium, and vitamin K, all of which are good for bones. So there's a very strong theory here that our cal vegans' lower calcium intakes are not a problem. Well, then more research started to come out. Um, it turns out that hip fractures are affected by a lot of things other than whether someone has osteoporosis. It can be, um, ba the, the risk of falling is a big a factor, as is the, the um, the shape of the hip and whether it's prone to fracture. So um, you can see that hip fractures are much higher in Sweden and lower in Japan and Hong Kong where dairy intake is less, dairy is very high, uh, dairy intake is very high in Sweden. But then lay, uh, in more recent research looked at uh, spine fractures, which is a better indication of osteoporosis, and you find that actually the countries where the dairy intake is less have more spine, spinal fractures. Then more research was done studying the, the le leaching calcium from the bones theory when you eat a, a large amount of animal protein. And what's been found, this is just one study, there have been m many done on it. Uh, one of the things that are found is that you, in you increase calcium absorption. So what might be happening is you're, just, you're, you're increasing calcium absorption with the protein and then you're just urinating it out because your body doesn't need the extra calcium. Um, and, and so that's one explanation. Another thing they found is that when you eat whole foods, this effect is very dull compared to when you give just someone some, some concentrated animal protein. In 2009, and it's the best analysis I know of uh, since then as well, they looked at a, a whole bunch of studies um, looking at protein intake and what the effect is on the bones. This was not done by the dairy industry either. And this is what they found. Two studies, there was an increased risk of fracture with animal protein. One study, there was increased risk with total protein. But in two studies, there was a decreased risk with animal protein. Uh, another two, there was a decreased risk with, vet, with vegetable or soy protein. Uh, there were many null findings. Many of the studies found no association between protein and fractures. And the, the researchers concluded, uh, they actually went over a lot more information than what I just presented there, but it's too much to go into. Um, overall, the weight of evidence shows that the effect of dietary protein on the skeleton appears to be favorable to a small extent, or at least is not detrimental. So that's kind of the mainstream uh, scientific consensus at, that, at this time that I don't think is an anti-vegan bias, in my opinion. Um, now, the bone fractures have been studied in vegans as well. Um, after five years in Epic Oxford, in which 1,000 vegans were followed and 10,000 lactovo vegetarians, and then the rest being meat eaters, um, vegans had a 30% higher rate of fracture than meat eaters. Uh, they adjusted for things like physical activity to determine whether it was, well, what it, whether it was due to something else. Um, and, but they found that the vegans, if you separated vegans into those getting 525 milligrams of calcium or more versus those getting that much or less, the ones getting more, the vegans getting more, had the same rate of fractures as meat eaters. 55% um, of vegans were getting 525 milligrams or more, meaning 45% were not. So 45% of the vegans were getting a fairly low amounts of calcium. Um, whereas in the other diet groups, about 95% were getting that much calcium or more. So uh, there were other analysis of this, of these, of this population, and such as looking at vitamin D and trying to determine whether what was causing this. And to date, as far as we can tell, it's the calcium intake. Then the Adventist Health Study 2 also did a five-year follow-up. Um, they didn't adjust the study for much, but they found that vegans had twice the rate of hip fractures as the meat eaters. So this has given me caution, uh, and uh, it makes me think that we do have to make sure we're getting enough calcium. So how can vegans get calcium? Well, I mentioned calcium absorption is good from leafy greens. That really depends on the leafy green. Um, so compared to cow's milk, which is absorbed at 22 to 32%, uh, depending on the study that's looked at it, 
Kale is absorbed at 40 to 60 percent. Now, kale doesn't have quite as much calcium, so you're not going to get it. You're not. You, you have to know how much calcium you're getting to equal cow's milk, but um, it is absorbed at a higher rate. Soy milk is about 18 to 22 percent. Supplements, on average, are around 30. It really doesn't matter that much which supplement you're taking. Um, mustard greens based on, so the, the limiting factor in calcium absorption from leafy greens is how much oxalate is in the, in the leafy green. And some leafy greens are very high in oxalate and some are very low. Based on the oxalate content and the calcium content, mustard greens should be very high, turnip greens high, collard greens decently high, and bok choy. Broccoli is also high, but broccoli doesn't have a whole lot of calcium. We used to think it had a lot. Recently, the USDA, which, which uh, analyzes different foods for how much nutrient content, downgraded broccoli and they lowered the amount of calcium that's in it, unfortunately. So I don't really tend to rely on broccoli these days. Spinach is very high in oxalate, uh, so it, you only absorb about 5% of the calcium. Swiss chard and beet greens are also uh, low absorption because they're very high in oxalate. And I'm not suggesting don't eat spinach. Uh, it's very good for iron and many other things, but it's not a good source for calcium. So here are my recommendations. Uh, like I said, the government recommends 1,000 milligrams per day. I think vegans should get at least 700 milligrams per day. Um, and here's three options of how you might do that. You could eat three servings of the greens I talked about at a half cup cooked. Now other leafy greens like lettuces, lettuces are not high in calcium, so you can't rely on that, even though they are somewhat leafy green. You can also do uh, fortified soy milk or orange juice. Also, if you buy tofu and eat tofu, if you get the calcium set type of tofu, and you can tell by reading the ingredients and seeing if there's calcium in the ingredients, um, that's another way to get a lot of calcium. Or just take a three to 500 milligram supplement, and like I said earlier, to get plenty of protein. Okay, so now what everyone knew about, which was exciting for me, was vitamin B12. Um, where am I at? Okay. Plants do not naturally contain vitamin B12. They don't have a requirement for it, and they don't produce it themselves. It is produced by some bacteria that's in mammalian feces. Um, so because uh, some of the bacteria in our feces produce B12, it can be found in contaminated water or food, um, and it could possibly be in fermented foods, especially if those foods have these bacteria in it. No fermented food that I'm aware of requires a bacteria that has B12 to ferment it. So you can't just assume that if a fermented food has B12, in fact, in the United States, none have been shown to actually have B12. Um, and so there's also talk about, well, whether certain types of algae and seaweeds have B12. And there's, I, I can't get into the details of that too much, uh, which you can read on veganhealth.org, all, all the details you would want. But um, it, it could be that some algaes have been contaminated either with insects or with contaminated water. But algae, it, there's no indication that algae produces vitamin B12. Okay, so um, there's many inactive analogs, and that's to some extent why there's a debate about what plant foods might have B12 in them. Because there's a number of molecules that look like B12, and when food's tested, uh, they can produce a result that makes it appear like there might be B12 in it. Unfortunately, these inactive analogs can actually block B12 absorption and the function in cells. So really to determine whether a plant food has vitamin B12, you have to get a group of people that have B12 deficiency, feed them the plant food, and see what happens to their B12 levels. And to date, no food has, has been shown to, to improve, no plant food has been shown to improve uh, vitamin B12 status. And so. Until there is one, it's just good not to, uh, not to think that any, anything you read on the internet about what food has B12, if it's a plant food, uh, just assume that that's probably not right. Um, the gold standard is lowering methylmalonic acid. That is how you determine whether someone's B12 status is improving. Um, okay, so I just went over that, sorry. So now here are foods that are rumored to contain B12 that I get a lot of, and um, I'll go over them quickly since I just told you that none of them really uh, have been shown to have it. Uh, Blue-green algae, spirulina, seaweeds like nori and chlorella, um, fermented foods, brewer's yeast, or any unfortified nutritional yeast. Some nutritional yeast is fortified with vitamin B12, and that would be a good source of B12. Any organic foods, there's people in the vegan community that say you just need to leave your organic food on the counter for a while, and uh, bacteria will produce B12 on it. 
there's no evidence that that's true. Intestinal bacteria sh should not be relied on. Aloe vera, I've seen that being claimed as having B12. And there is a vegan nutritionist that says that B12 is floating around in the air, and I am not kidding. Okay. So there's two types of B12 deficiency. The first is overt, in which it's obvious there's something wrong with you. Um, it can represent with macrocytic or megaloblastic anemia, so you'll feel tired. You don't necessarily get that because if you eat enough folate, the folate can uh, take, pl take the B12's place and prevent the deficiency, at least in early stages. Um, and overt B12 deficiency can manifest as neurological damage. Tingling in the t toes and fingers can be a sign of B12 deficiency, and that's typically the first sign other than just fatigue. Um, then there's also subclinical B12 deficiency, and that's determined by having an elevated homocysteine level. Um, it can, it's linked with dementia and Alzheimer's disease and stroke and low bone mineral density in vegetarians. So unfortunately, we can't just say, oh, how do I feel? I feel fine, so I don't have any issue with B12. It's really important that vegans get enough B12. It's extremely easy to do, and if you do it, you probably have a better B12 uh, level than meat eaters. So by, by being aware of vitamin B12, we can have an advantage actually at, from being vegan. Now, um, I don't need to spend too much time on this, but this just shows that people who don't, vegans who don't supplement with B12 have lower vitamin B12 levels than other diet groups and that their homocysteine is a lot higher and you don't want a real high homocysteine. Um, if you get getting up to 12 to 15 is where it's been associated with disease um, and in B12 supplementing vegetarians their homocysteine levels are, are quite good. Um, this study from Germany, the first group shows the vegans at creeping up around 11, that's not too bad uh, and that's just people randomly taking supplements or eating fortified foods. Uh, there's, and same thing with the USA study, that's a great homocysteine level below 8 and those people were getting an average of 5.6 micrograms per day. And then there's a group of people who were taking 500 micrograms per day uh, for two months and their homocysteine is about the lowest I've ever seen. So it's definitely easy to get your homocysteine levels down, but it's something that we should definitely be doing. Um, and here's what I recommend. Fortified foods twice per day. You can only absorb so much B12 per day through the main absorption mechanism in your body. Uh, so you, once you overload it, you want to wait another, a few hours before you eat another fortified food. And generally you need two, for, two doses of fortified foods a day. Or a 25 to 100 microgram supplement per day should be enough. Or 1,000 micrograms twice a week if you chew it well. So those are different ways to get it. And um, yes. All right, so vitamin D, that it regulates calcium absorption and excretion, especially when calcium intake is low. Uh, it can be made by the, the UV rays on the skin. And in Madison in the winter, you're not gonna make any uh, vitamin D. In the summer, you can. So again, it's not synthesized in northern climates during the winter. And a deficiency of vitamin D can cause muscle weakness and pain. I don't, I don't think vitamin D is something that all vegans need to worry about. Um, but I have met a number of vegans, or come across a number of vegans, maybe a few dozen, that have gotten pretty severe vitamin D deficiency. This happens to meat eaters all the time as well. Uh, but so it's just something to be aware of. And, uh, and, and many of the people that I've talked to, once they start taking vitamin D, then this all goes away and they're, and they're fine. Um, so that's good that, that it's easy to solve. Here's average vitamin D levels. Your average vegan has enough vitamin D, and this was in uh, the UK where there's not a lot of sunlight. Uh, the, the Institute of Medicine recommends levels of 50 to 125, and the average vegan was about 56. It was a little bit lower because a lot of milk is fortified with vitamin D, and that's how meat eaters tend to get it. It's also in fish oil. There was one study in vegans in Finland. Now they're very far north, so they're not gonna be getting much sunlight uh, in which 200, 200 uh, international units of vitamin D each day for 12, 11 months increased their lower backbone density in four out of five vegans. And um, that is not like four out of five dentists uh, recommend Crest. That was literally four out of five vegans. There was five vegans in that study. So it was a small study. Um, <laughs> 
D2 versus D3. D2 is always vegan. Vitamin D3 is usually not vegan. So there's a big question, well, uh, what type of vitamin D should a vegan take? There is one company that's been making vitamin D3 for, for a number of years now, uh, VitaShine. There are a few other companies that are claiming to make vitamin D3. And to my knowledge, this is the only one that's been verified to my satisfaction. I mean, not to my knowledge. This is the only one that I know of that's been verified to my satisfaction. I don't know if any new have come on the market recently. Um, in large doses of 50,000 international units once per week, and that's how vitamin D deficiency is typically treated, vitamin D3 does stay in the system longer. Um, however, D, uh, vitamin D deficiency has traditionally been treated with D2, not D3, uh, but D3 is a bit more effective. In smaller amounts, D2 s seems to be just as effective, or I would say it's definitely effective enough, uh, even if there are tiny differences. Um, and taking vitamin D with fat increases absorption. Vitamin D and vitamin A, or beta carotene for vegans, are both uh, fat soluble, so when you eat fat with them, then you're gonna absorb more. So the, uh, the RDA is 600 international units. Uh, your typical fortified soy milk only has 80 to 120. If you have no, if you don't think you're, you have any uh, vitamin D deficiency, then uh, fortified soy milk is probably fine. Um, but in the winter especially, I would probably recommend that vegans get 1,000 international units um, in Madison especially, uh, since it's so far north, and uh, take it every day just during the winter months. And then you'll be sure to be getting enough. But here's some other options for sun. You can't be, um, you can't be wearing sunscreen, and the sun has to be strong enough to, to cause sunburn. You don't want to get a sunburn, but it has to be that strong. Um, and so that's, that's how to get it through sun or a 1,000 international unit supplement. It's very inexpensive. You can buy a winter supply for about $6 usually. Iodine is a nutrient that most people don't think too much about. Um, it used to be a big problem in many, in many parts of the world and the parts of the US. Iodine is found in some uh, produce and some plant foods, but it really depends on where it's grown and what, uh, how it tends to be higher in food grown close to the ocean. Um, but it's, we don't really know what, you never know what food's going to have iodine, except for seaweed. Seaweed is, reliably has iodine. Let's see, did I, okay. So um, one study was done on iodine in vegans in Boston, and they found that vegans, on average, uh, should have been getting a bit more iodine. Um, and so it is something that has been shown that we should be paying more attention to. Um, the RDA is 150 micrograms. If you don't regularly eat iodized salt or sea vegetables and know that salt in processed food is generally not iodized, you have to act, only table salt is going to be iodized. Um, if you don't regularly eat these two things, then you should, um, and especially if you regularly eat soy, you should get a multivitamin that contains iodine or just take an iodine supplement. You don't want too much iodine, so don't take more than the RDA. Don't go crazy. Don't think, I haven't had iodine in a while. I'm going to eat a bunch. Um, so. Uh, just stick with moderate amounts. How many? Okay. Okay, now I'll talk a little bit about iron. Um, vegans tend to have as higher, higher intakes of iron than meat eaters. A lot of people might be surprised by that. But there, iron, iron is very prevalent in plant foods. But plant iron is not absorbed as well as iron from meat. Um, there's some benefits and uh, some, there's some pros and cons to that. Uh, because sometimes you don't want to be absorbing iron. And then other times, other people do need to be. Your body regulates the absorption of plant iron more easily than it does iron from meat. Vegan men rarely have iron deficiency. Um, I have found that it, and anecdotally and through bloggers on the internet that stop being vegan, that uh, vegetarian women sometimes have deficiency and um, especially endurance runners. When you're an endurance runner, you need a lot more iron because your foot actually destroys blood cells as it strikes the ground. Um, vitamin C significantly increases iron absorption by a lot. In, in fact, so much that if you do tend to be, toward, tend to be anemic, um, increasing your vitamin C intake is more likely to do more than increasing your iron intake if you're, if you're a vegan. Here's foods that are high in vitamin C, um, which you can add to meals. Studies have shown that uh, people who have iron deficiency, when they add those, uh, when they add vitamin C to meals, 
can cure iron deficiency. Also, coffee and tea inhibit iron, so you don't drink with meals if you're prone to anemia. And it's best if you think you might have anemia to see a doctor to know for sure. It's a very common, simple test, and then you'll, it, you won't be guessing. Um, I have an article on how to, cure, uh, how, how to help cure iron deficiency at veganhealth.org. There's not a whole lot more than what I just told you. Don't drink coffee and tea with meals and increase your vitamin C. I know one vegan who got diagnosed with iron deficiency anemia. She increased her beans and greens for a year, went back to the doctor, and she was fine. So she actually did cure it by just eating more iron. She said that she had been skimping on those foods. Um, vitamin A. It's very easy to get enough vitamin A on a vegan diet, but you have to eat these uh, orange vegetables. Um, so the, the uh, recommended amount is 700 for women, 900 well, RAE for men. Uh, again, eat with fat, and these are foods that are very high in, in uh, retinal activity equivalence is what that stands for. Carrot juice, carrots, cantaloupe. There's other foods that aren't quite so high, but those are the, the best ones. Uh, vegans, zinc and vegan diets. Vegans tend to get close to the RDA for zinc, um, and so, but zinc's a little harder to absorb from plant foods. I, I would say that you don't need to worry about it unless you're finding any of these, ooh, uh, air loss, any of these um, symptoms. Hair loss is what that should say, uh, impaired immune function, dermatitis, and poor wound healing. And here's foods that are high in zinc, so make sure you're eating enough of these. And a supplement is a very easy way to get zinc. Okay, so um, I want to talk a little bit about soy and breast cancer, because that's a common question people have. And it's, uh, luckily, the research has been very positive towards soy and breast cancer. Um, as of 2006, the, the studies had been positive, but they hadn't looked at people who, who eat as much soy as some vegans might eat. The, the highest intake category was one serving per day, and um, those people had a slightly lower risk of getting breast cancer. Then in 2009, the Shanghai Women's Health Study uh, had a, enough people to have a higher category, enough people eating a lot of soy to have a higher category, and they found that uh, women eating three servings per day cut their risk of breast cancer in half, and the finding was statistically signi highly significant. Um, so that was good news for soy. And then there's been some studies on women who have been diagnosed with breast cancer, and they follow them and measure how much soy they eat, and then they, they determine whether soy is good for women with breast cancer. And here's the, I just want to uh, read the conclusion of the researchers that did one of these studies. Um, our study is the third epidemiological study to report no adverse effects of soy foods on breast cancer prognosis. These studies taken together vary in ethnic composition um, and by level and type of soy consumption. And they provide the necessary evidence that clinicians no longer need to advise against soy consumption for women diagnosed with breast cancer. And that includes estrogen positive cancers. And a lot of, uh, uh, unfortunately, a lot of clinicians have not been following this, and they do advise women to not eat soy. Um, so in, in any case, the evidence is not in favor of doing that. And even the American Cancer Society uh, came out with this, uh, an article in 2012 on their website, which is still there. And they say, even though animal studies have shown mixed effects on breast cancer with soy supplements, studies in humans have not shown harm from eating soy foods. Moderate consumption of soy foods appears to be safe for both both breast cancer survivors and the general population and may even lower breast cancer risk. Avoid soy supplements until, until more research is done. <clears throat> so um, then one thing that I think vegans should be aware of are oxalates. If you eat a whole lot of oxalates, you can get kidney stones, and some greens are very high in oxalate, particularly spinach, beet greens, Swiss chard, and rhubarb. If you do green smoothies and you are only using high oxalate vegetables, uh, just be aware that you might want to tone that down a bit and maybe use kale instead, in, or, or to some extent. I mean, some people are just fine, but then some people do get kidney stones. Um, okay, and um, there's actually a whole community that's risen up around avoiding oxalate, and they don't just have kidney stones, but it's not clear whether they're, uh, what they think is true or not um, about oxalate, and, and even regards to themselves. They think they do better without oxalates. Um, Omega-3 is something I want to touch on but not spend a lot of time on because I think the evidence just isn't there for what vegans should do, if anything, about it. Um, it used to be a little bit more convincing, but as time goes on, it gets less, actually. Um, there are short-chain omega-3s, uh, which is alpha-linolenic acid, or ALA. It's found in a number of plant foods, 
Long chain omega 3s are EPA, they reduce inflammation. DHA is a component of nerve tissue, and um, it's found in fish and algae. Vegan supplements can be made from algae. Uh, the body can convert ALA to EPA and EPA into DHA. And vegans tend to have low blood levels of DHA. So the question is, do vegans need to raise their levels of DHA? Um, and the answer is we don't know. And um, if you want to be prudent, then I recommend a DHA supplement. I think here's something that I think all vegans should be doing, though, adding more ALA to their diets than what they're just going to get uh, by chance. And that is uh, it can be just three halves of a walnut. That's not very much. A quarter teaspoon of flaxseed oil, a teaspoon of canola oil, or a teaspoon of ground flax seeds. Those are the most common ways to do it. There's other hemp seeds and chia seeds also uh, have uh, omega ALA. And on my veganhealth.org, I have the amounts. You want to avoid cooking with omega-6s because omega-6s prevent that conversion of ALA to EPA to DHA. And so if you eat a whole lot of omega-6, which is found in high amounts in corn, soil, sa soy, safflower, sunflower, anything called vegetable oil, oil and even sa sesame oil, um, yeah, that is, uh, it's going to prevent the conversion. So instead, using olive, peanut, avocado, or canola oil. Um, is a good, is a way, better way for cooking. I think if you eat sesame, use sesame oil, I know a lot of people love to cook with that. I think it's fine to use occasionally, but you don't want to um, be overloading your, your body with a large amount of these oils every day. And then optional, two to 300 milligrams of DHA every two to three days. As people get older, they lose the ability to convert DHA, and so it might be an even better idea if you're over 50 to do that, to, to take a supplement. Um, so here is some very good news. Um, and remember all the stuff I presented at the beginning of the talk was very good news as well. Um, but here are kids, we have a, web, uh, a page on veganhealth.org of kids who are vegan from conception and then some all the way through adulthood. And many of them uh, have very high intelligence in adulthood. Um, and they, uh, many, these kids are doing great. So it shows that you don't need animal products to create a human body, um, though they do take vitamin B12, uh, which comes from bacteria, not animal products. Um, if you're interested in following the research as it comes out, anytime I update veganhealth.org, I put out a post on jacknorrisrd.com on my blog, and so you can keep track of it there. Um, Vegan Outreach has a blog, of, a vegan food and lifestyle blog, which you can sign up for at veganoutreach.org. And we are in the final days of Team Vegan. If you're interested in supporting Vegan Outreach between now and Tuesday, any donation to Vegan Outreach will be doubled by some generous donors. Um, this is our yearly summer fundraiser. So that's all. It looks like I have uh, five or 10 minutes for questions. Five. Okay, five minutes if anyone has questions. Yes. So um, is there anything wrong with uh, vegan protein? Okay. Yeah. The question is, um, is there anything wrong with vegan protein supplements, especially ones with spirulina that might block vitamin B12? I don't, you know, that hasn't really been researched carefully, the B12 part of the spirulina. Only, only um, spirulina supplements have been, have been researched. And if you're getting enough B12 in other ways, I don't think you need to worry about spirulina blocking your B12. Uh, so only if that's the only B12 you're relying on, should that, should that be a problem? Does that make sense? And, yeah, and then in terms of supplements, whether I think they're safe other, otherwise or just with regard to B12? Um, well, you know, there's a lot of protein powders that mm. have, you know, good sources of protein as well as the beans in them. Is anything wrong with them or are they just not beneficial? Well, I, so if you, I think the people that can use protein supplements, either their, their, their diets are very low or they are, they're just starting a bodybuilding regimen and they, they, so there's a beginning of, of any bodybuilding training where you're going to grow a lot of muscle fast. And I think that protein supplements at that point are probably going to be somewhat beneficial. Though tofurkey sausage also will do the trick because it's so high. Um, and, and then I don't, I don't think that the, the supplements are going to do much damage. It might, you might find them to be excess calories. 
but I don't think it'll, they'll be harmful unless you're just taking massive amounts, which most people don't. If you take 20 grams to 40 grams from a supplement, I don't think there's a problem with that. Yeah, does that answer your question then? Sure. Yeah. Okay, let, um, yes, you. Do you, um, what is your opinion on, like when you talk about soy canola, um, as far as doing organic, as opposed to genetically modified, which is basically glyphosate, which is chelating minerals out? So, uh, chelating minerals out, I'm not aware of that being that's the problem with GMOs. That's so, uh, what? That's I'm what so glyphosate was invented to clean, clean boilers, and they realized it killed, killed plants. So, glyphosate chelates all minerals out. So, um, I don't, most of the research on oils is done with uh, just conventional oils, and my understanding, I'm not an expert on GMOs, but I do follow it to some extent. And, um, you know, the problem with GMOs would be proteins. So if you're eating oils, you're not getting much pro I mean, uh, oils have a very minuscule amount of protein in them. You can't even measure it really in typical assays. So that shouldn't be a problem. I mean, I try to eat mostly organic foods for the environment and for the animals that can be harmed by pesticides and that sort of thing. And I think there is some benefit for your body in terms of not eating pet foods with pesticides. GMO, I'm not so convinced, unless you're allergic to the, the GMO, that it's harming you personally. There's a whole debate about whether, you know, uh, politically and that sort of thing, the problems with GMOs. But I'm not aware of any hard evidence that shows that GMOs harm humans from the proteins in them. Uh, that's, so, uh, does that answer your question? I, I uh, okay. And yes? Can you tell me uh, what the benefits from Almond, well, almond products like well, almonds, like many nuts, are associated with uh, reduced risk for heart disease and even for uh, weight gain in many, many studies. Uh, you know, I, I have yet to see a study where nuts were not found to be beneficial in some way. So I recommend uh, that you eat nuts in your diet. You don't necessarily need almonds. I live in California where everyone is outraged about all the water that almonds take. Um, and don't necessarily pay much attention to the, all the water that animal agriculture takes. Um, but, um, but yeah, almonds are a very healthy food to eat. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, what's your opinion on raw versus cooked like vegetables? Um, I don't, I'm not aware of evidence that, or I should say, I don't think there's evidence that you need to eat all raw foods or that there's a certain percentage of your diet that needs to be raw foods. Um, I don't think it's a bad idea to eat a decent amount of raw foods. I wouldn't, you know, most raw foodists I think these days try to stick with 75% maybe or 90 to percent. It's not 100% like it was in the early 90s. So it makes it a little bit easier to do and then you can maybe get more higher protein foods, if, uh, at least in terms of the common foods that, that are available that people tend to eat. Um, but you know, I don't, I don't have, I don't see a reason to do it, but I also don't have terribly strong feelings that no, if you feel good on a raw foods diet, you shouldn't do it. I mean, be aware of everything that I talked about, the calcium in particular, and B12. And if you do get colds, a lot of times people think, oh, these colds are a sign of my body detoxing all this phlegm. Um, I would suggest it's more a sign that you got sick because your immunity was too low and you should maybe have more protein. Um, and so I just be aware, but I think people who thrive, my understanding is that Derek Tracizi, one of the bodybuilders I showed, is a raw foodist, and I don't know to what extent, but um, he certainly seems to be thriving on it uh, as well. Sometimes I think that athletes actually do better on raw foods because they're eating so much food that they're just, your, your, food, your protein needs aren't going to increase as much as your calorie needs on a, uh, when you're an athlete. So by eating a lot more calories, you're going to just naturally meet your protein needs. Um, but I do know of a lot of raw foodist athletes that seem to do well. Um, but it's something I don't think people should pressure themselves to do. Yes? I've heard good things about grapeseed oil and bad things about canola oil. Uh, well, the canola oil is, um, tends to be genetically modified. Is that what you've heard that, about it? I mean, I, I, I'm not aware of canola oil being bad for humans in regards to just eating it in, for their health. Um, you don't want to eat too much oil, of course. Um, but small amounts of canola oil I think are fine and then 
whether you want to contribute, eat GMO foods or not. And I don't know what percentage is GMO. If it's a, some people have argued that it's 100%, I think, because of the original way it was synthesized. Um, and I don't know all the details about that. So I'm sorry about that. Yes, in the back. To some people choosing a, so the question is, what do I feel about people with eating disorders choosing a vegan diet to help recover from an eating disorder? That's not my area of expertise, and eating disorders are such a uh, uh, delicate subject matter that I don't really want to say anything about that. I know a bit of research that's done on um, vegan diets and whether vegan diets cause eating disorders, and it doesn't seem that they do, but I do think that sometimes they can be used to mask an eating disorder. Um, but again, I, in terms of using one to treat one, I, that's out of my area of expertise, sorry. Um, any other questions? Yes? Well, how much, so the question is how much fat we do we need? Um, that's a very good question and a hotly debated topic. There is evidence that some people eat, you know, 10% or less fat. Some, some cultures eat that amount of fat and do fine. And then, um, you know, the, the government recommendations are for 30% or lower. And your average vegan eats about 27 to 29% fat. And they, our, our risk for diabetes is clearly less and probably our risk for heart disease is quite a bit less. So we seem to be doing fine. I mean, we tend to eat less calories. And so just eating less calories is a, is, gives you a big advantage in many ways. Um, and so then the fat doesn't, the percentage of fat doesn't matter so much. But, um, you know, I, I, I think that it's good to not overdo fat. I don't think you have to get down to 15% um, by any means. And I do run into vegans occasionally who get very low cholesterol levels and they lose their, um, they lose their libido or, or other related things. And then they start eating more coconut oil for the saturated fat and they do feel a lot better. This is just anecdotally, it's not been studied in any way. Uh, so I think you can possibly, if you do a very low fat diet for many years, I could see that it could cause you to not feel as good as if you were eating a higher fat diet. But it's, I, think it's, I think it tends to be a very, uh, uh, very personal thing. And there is some research out of Stanford that shows certain people metabolize fat better than they metabolize carbohydrates and vice versa. And it depends on your genetics. And that's, that research still has to be teased out. It's in its, I think it's in its infancy, but they, it seems to be, uh, there seems to be something there. Yeah, that's probably all I have time for. Thank you very much, everyone.